Just pray that you would wrap your arms around those who suffer right now, uh, that you would comfort them with your love, that you would surround them with community, and that you would also inspire us to figure out how to best support everyone in our midst. So we're grateful for this day, and we pray that you would prepare our hearts now to hear from you. Um, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. The scriptures today is found in Acts 2, the first uh, 21st verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of them hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God bless to our understanding and to our everyday living, the message found in this passage. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. According to the Christian calendar of biblical readings, Today is Pentecost Sunday. Since the 1969 event in New York City, today is also Pride Day. Though the Bible does not mention Pride Day, my aim in this sermon is to bring these two events together, Pentecost and Pride. For over 2,000 years, Christians have celebrated this day 
which beginning with Easter Sunday occurs 50 days thereafter. It is the birthday of the Christian church, which without intending to do so, marks a profound division within the Jewish religion. Like all ancient religions, Judaism was a tribal religion, or in other words, it was a spiritual force that unified those who spoke a common language and were descended from a common ancestor, who in this case was their revered ancestral father, Abraham. Now it's important to note that Pentecost was a Christian takeover of a Jewish holiday known as the Feast of the Harvest. That feast also celebrated God's gift of the law to Moses at Sinai. In today's reading of Acts 2, we learn that after Jesus ascended to heaven, his followers had gathered to celebrate the Feast of the Harvest, where they were invaded by the Holy Spirit. The event was reported as an unusual spiritual experience, so unusual that it was described as miraculous. Now Jesus of Nazareth had been a reformer, one who sought to bring about changes in Judaism. Like all reformers, he was on the left wing of the organization and his views were considered abhorrent to the established authorities. Thus a profound conflict between the two characterized their relationship, which was similar to the conflict that presently exists between Republicans and Democrats over gun control and other issues. That is to say, those who are in authority and those who seek change represent opposing world views that openly conflict with each other. Again, it is important to note that Jesus and his followers were Jews who did not seek the destruction of Judaism, but simply wanted to correct its wrongdoings by urging it to renew its covenant with God in light of new insights deeply rooted in the law, in the prophetic teaching, and in the patriarchal wisdom. But in ancient times, and especially in tribal religions, assassination was the most prominent way of dealing with reformers, whom the ruling authorities considered to be troublemakers. Now, I should make it clear that when I speak about a tribal religion, I do not mean to imply any disrespect for the notion of tribe itself, because a tribe is simply an ethnic group related by blood and territory. In fact, a tribe is much like a family, though on a larger scale. Like families, however, Tribes are insular in nature. Under normal conditions, neither families nor tribes have any impulse to embrace the internal values or traditions of other tribes or families. That is what being insular means. It means isolation. And when living alongside one another, both families and tribes, as we know, must work hard at being good neighbors because caring for one's neighbor does not come naturally. And so the problem is not tribe, but tribalism. Attempt to make your own values universal. Now let's move from this brief sociological analysis to the theological importance of Pentecost. Clearly, the Pentecost event was an earth-shattering experience. 
its spiritual significance was remembered because of its surreal character that had an enduring effect on Jesus' small, fearful group of followers, who while still mourning his horrific death, had experienced the event firsthand. One that the writer of the Acts of the Apostles reported as a miracle because it was incomprehensible. At each annual feast of the harvest, people from a wide variety of tribal groups always gathered in Jerusalem, the capital city, where the Ark of the Covenant was located in the temple. It was a great annual event, similar to our Christmas celebration. The smells of different foods permeated the air, as did the voices of people speaking different languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Coptic, as well as those of the Medes and the Elamites, the Parth Parthians, the Phrygians, the Amphilians, the Libyans, the Cretans, the Arabians, and others. Under normal circumstances, most people would have been oblivious to the smells of various types of food, and they would have paid no attention to the sounds of languages that they did not understand, and viewed it as a lot of meaningless chat. But on this occasion, they were able to hear and understand the message in their own languages, which utterly amazed them. Since the disciples had come from what many viewed as the uneducated and provincial backwater towns and villages of Galilee, those who heard them speak were all the more amazed by their ability to communicate with them across so many different languages. Consequently, they jokingly thought that the disciples must be drunk. But their leader, Peter, immediately entered that humorous spirit by saying, no, they are not drunk because it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Thus implying that had it been later in the day, the accusation <laughs> might have been more accurate. <laughs> Nonetheless, the people were surprised to hear these Galileans, whom they looked upon as mere country yokels, speaking with authority in languages that they could readily understand. One explanation is that the people had come with the expectation that the worship in the capital city would be conducted in classical, high classical Hebrew language which they, as ordinary educated people, uneducated people, had no expectation of understanding. After all, uh, from their point of view, they had come regularly to this festival to be blessed and not to understand. Instead, it might have been the case that they heard the disciples speaking in the ordinary language of Hebrew, a marketplace lingua that everyone could understand. But let me hasten to say, however, that such an explanation does not take away its miraculous nature. Keep in mind that everyone present heard the message in their own tongue, which is the language, of, which is in the essence of the Pentecost event. That does not mean to be any grounds whatsoever to assume that the disciples were speaking in some unknown spiritual language that the people could not understand. Most important, the primary message of Pentecost is that the disciples were being commissioned to preach the gospel to the larger world rather than to Jews alone. The gospel was intended for all of God's people everywhere. Its mission field was to be the world at large. And we here, the Church of Fame, 
are among its countless errors. Though the Pentecost event was intended, was intended to specify and celebrate the universal nature of Jesus' teaching, more often than not, many who embrace that teaching over the centuries have chosen to compress it into some narrow uh, tribal ethos. Thus, in the fourth century of the Common Era, when the Emperor Constantine was baptized, he quickly made Christianity his own imperial religion. By doing so, he ended the many persecutions of Christians by making Christianity the official religion of the empire. While many Christians viewed that as a victory for Christianity, it was in fact an endeavor to make the Christian religion a tribal religion that embraced the imperial flag and all the prominent values pertaining to imperialism itself. And as such, many succeeding empires did likewise. In the 11th century, 1054 AD to be precise, the churches in the East, the churches in the West were split into the Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Eastern Orthodox Church in the East, each as an expansive, powerful influence at the center of an empire, each a tribal religion with no communion with the other. Here in the Western world, the birth of Protestantism in the 16th century began as a reform movement within the Roman Catholic Church that resulted in the splintering of the Western Church into numerous competing groups that led to increasing attempts to turn the universality of Christianity into the narrow confines of such tribal groups as Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists and Episcopalians and Mennonites and Hutterites and Baptists and Pentecostalists <laughs> and Adventists and Mormons, etc., etc., etc. The universe divisions within each of them all contemporary Christians, including ourselves, are caught up in this tribal inheritance. And how sad it is and how far away we have moved from the way the gospel was intended to be. Unlike tribal religions that are reserved for the clan alone, the religion that Jesus proclaimed was a universal religion aimed at including everyone on the planet. Both then and now, such a universal religion was unthinkable. To have a church that would be inclusive of all is to have a church that affirms the vast diversity that God has created. Diversity of nationality, of race, of social status, ethnicity, of gender, of sexuality. Significant unity remains a distant hope despite some endeavors to actualize it like the ecumenical movement and interreligious dialogues. In a universal church, none is excluded. Rather, all are viewed as God's children invited to be baptized and commissioned to proclaim the salvatory message of Jesus, of Nazareth, in their own languages, such that the people can understand. Unfortunately, the gospel that was intended to be universal soon became captive to various colonial forces bent on turning Jesus' universal gospel into a tribal religion. As stated in the beginning, today is also Pride Sunday that openly celebrates the LBGTQ 
plus community, which in turn, like the civil rights movement, the feminist and womanist movements that have inspired Asians and Latinx and numerous indigenous movements to celebrate their religious dignity, dignities, their respective dignities, and demand that God-given rights and freedoms be seen and heard in their own languages. God grant us all sufficient grace to affirm one another with no boundaries of segregation, discrimination, or terror. Now is the time for you to share your thoughts with us. What I want to say, thank goodness it's you that was reading the scripture with all those names of different <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know anybody that would have done a better job to <laughs> be able to pronounce all those. Um, thank you for as you always do giving me a different view. Earlier, you said that Jesus was a reformer. Reform went into reform Judaism, which was a tribalist religion. And yet, his message, you said, was universalist. So, was the plan that it was only going to come after his death that the message, the universalist message? You see where I'm, there's, it seems conflicting. Am I making sense? Say some more. Okay. Well, you had said earlier, and I always thought Jesus didn't establish Christianity because he just was trying to reform Judaism, uh -huh. and Judaism was a tribal religion. And then you said Jesus's message, which I agree with too, is universalist, and yet there seems to be an incongruency there between the tribalism of Judaism and him wanting to reform that which particular right particular, particular tribal religion versus in the universalist message and maybe it was Pentecost where that that God's will was coming down that it was a universalist for everyone it wasn't as apparent Jesus's because Jesus seemed to want to just reform Judaism he didn't seem like he was interested in starting a whole new Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. The, the way I would respond to that, to say that Jesus viewed the universality of the gospel, that God being universal for all people, and that is deeply rooted in Judaism, and that Judaism had misunderstood, or Judaism had intentionally turned what was um, to be universal into a tribal religion. And he was born into Judaism, but, but commissioned uh, to really dig deeply into Judaism and to try to teach the Jews that their understanding of, of religion being a very narrow thing for the, for the Jews alone, that that was not what the intention was. And that in they looked closely at the laws and closely at the at the teachings of the ancient the ancient teachings of the Jewish fathers. They would see the uh, that how the universality uh, was uh, was, uh, was was compressed uh, into uh, tribal thing for the clan alone, whereas it was to be for all of their neighbors and beyond. Yeah. Does anybody want to and say it's human human nature to say what I know and what I believe is right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It seems like uh, the universal nature was always the goal. Like you see threads of that through Judaism, but just box people in. Um, but even like, you know, we know that Israel's called for everybody, for the Gentiles, to be a light to the whole world and in so many ways, like, maybe do something else. 
So I don't think Jesus came to like start a new religion, but like, you know, I do think he was like, this was always the goal. What happened? <laughs> God speaks to, to people in their particularity, but the people in their particularity should not really claim that God is for themselves alone, <laughs> but that it's the eternal, universal God speaking to our particularity, but our particularity must respect that and, uh, and, and go up to others rather than simply and hold on to the God for ourselves. Exactly. So many, so many churches, you know, don't, the communion table is not open to people unless they embrace everything that they feel are essential. That's not true. It just makes me thinking about how, you know, we have and, um, and, and for Christians, they, for me, and I've heard so many times where, where it's not universal, is that they'll say, um, they'll use the scripture that, that any way you can get to heaven is through Jesus. And so that eliminates all, all the other religions all the other and all religions, the other powers yeah. in this world and yeah. brings it right back down to it. And it's, you know, it's another little section that you get beat over the head with by the Bible. So it, it just, uh, I mean, I can't, for me, I cannot believe that people can't see a God who is a God for everyone. I mean, to me, that just makes common sense. If, if, if he if was responsible for all of creation and he was responsible for everything that we have in this world today, then surely everyone who is human should come under that umbrella. And if we if we, we think that if we say that God is just what we think God is, what we think God is, then we limit God already to our own limited perspectives. And God is universal <laughs> and eternal, and uh, and is for all people who see glimpses of God only as glimpses. But in their own tongues, in their own visions. I mean, so, we can relate to him yeah. more than we ever been able to relate to other people yeah. of other religions and other countries because of the famine and the wars and the things that draw us as humans to each other. So it, it just just seems common sense to me. I, I don't know why you make everything so difficult. <laughs> 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 well, when we think of it from this point of view, the, the whole missionary movement of the 19th century and so forth is very, very problematic in the way in which it went about it. There was nothing wrong with them trying to proclaim God to all peoples in the world, but to, but to say to those peoples in the world that their views of God were idolatrous <laughs> and was wrong. I lived for a time in Nigeria, and there was a Baptist seminary there. And at the end of the of other seminaries as well, but at the um, and there were Baptist schools, uh, boarding schools, and the children were inspected, were 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 instructed, and this is both in the, in the boarding schools and in the seminary to when they went back home to their villages for the summer vacation that they should try to gather up as many of the so-called idols that they could find in their households 
that were often kept in basements and underneath the houses and so forth and brought out for certain, certain festivals. They were to bring those back in their school bags. And then the school would have a big bonfire uh, and burn them all uh, in, the, in the schoolyard. And this actually happened over and over again. And so, because the idea was, the, the limited idea of the missionaries was that these people were doing something terribly, terribly wrong by, um, by using these so-called idols uh, as aids to their, to their worship, and that they should only use the, the Christian idols, <laughs> the Christian yeah. symbols, the cross and so forth, which were, you know, from their point of view, look, were what they were doing. <laughs> Latin, Greek, 
but not in the vernacular. And the whole history of biblical translation is very, very problematic. And some of the people who initially uh, translated the Bible, they were actually um, killed, <laughs> assassinated uh, for doing such a horrible thing, uh, bringing the sacred language into the vernacular. <laughs> So that's a long story in itself as well. <laughs> it's amazing how much abuse we've done. It was, it was interesting and it was important for the Christian missionaries to learn the other languages that they were trying to use to proclaim Christ. But then they would proclaim Christ in such a way uh, that was important uh, to the universality by saying to the people that Christ did not address your culture, that Christ spoke to our culture only. That you are to be found like us. <laughs> but you could not, for the longest while, could not worship God in African languages. You have to worship God from the English language. <laughs> and, uh, I'll tell you this one story. Uh, you're a good friend of mine who was a head of the part yeah, of the bridge. Stay, stay back by I'm afraid that people are so oh, I see. Aren't, aren't getting this. Okay. A very good friend of mine who was the head of the Department of Religion in Nigeria at the university there. Uh, he had gone and, and studied in England. And um, and while studying there, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, film the, uh, the Ten Commandments came out in the mid 1950s, and he went to see this film, and he said that he had a, 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 a revelatory experience which changed his entire life, and that experience was that uh, he heard Jesus speaking or God speaking in an American accent. <laughs> And he, he had always thought that God spoke in an English accent. <laughs> and it was so shocking to him that he said, well, if God could speak in an American accent, then God could speak in a Nigerian accent. And so he decided then that he would take off all of his Western clothes and would put on Nigerian dress for the rest of his life. And one never saw him in a suit and tie uh, <laughs> after <again>. that. <laughs> uh, and that he, and said, so that, but is that interesting? <laughs> yeah. Again, the whole business of the particularity and universality. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much.